evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin tonight in Ottawa, where the Liberal government gave its fiscal update on Tuesday. A big part of it is the money the government has set aside to settle long-standing issues on the First Nations child welfare system. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. $40 billion. It's a lot of money. And after years of legal wrangling, this is the amount the government is putting forward over the next five years to try and fix a seriously flawed First Nations child welfare system. If and Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse says the government made the right decision by abandoning further litigation. I'm glad that the uh, um, Prime Minister and the Liberal government are at the table with us rather than in court. And I hope that um, we can find that path forward on, on um, compensation for children and, and many young people who have come through the child welfare system that 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 we um that we make sure that they get compensated for the harms that they have faced on and there's many <clears throat> and um also reforming um you know reforming our this broken system roughly half the money will go to compensate children and their families covered by a canadian human rights tribunal ruling the other half the to reforming the child the welfare system itself. Uh, but Indigenous yeah, Services ever, Minister Patty Haidu says no amount of money can ever make right well, the damage done. I mean, that's the tragedy. And we've sought, we've seen that, like, look, this country has a history of violent colonialism. And so whether we're talking about residential schools and the tragedy of people removed from their families through residential schools, the 60s scoop, and onwards through, you know, disproportionate numbers of children removed and placed into care, um, you're right, money is not going to make people whole. There's historical trauma that has resulted from uh, from this relationship. Details still need to be worked out and a final agreement signed, but NDP leader Jugmeet Singh says his party will be watching closely. But if there is a commitment from the federal government to stop fighting Indigenous kids in court, then that's a positive thing. And if there's a commitment to, to follow through on the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal's orders to make sure that the kids are compensated, that's also a, a, that would be a positive thing. Uh, we don't know the details if it's exactly that. And we're going to closely follow to see the response of the AFN, Indigenous children, uh, their families, uh, leaders like Cindy Blackstock. The proposed settlement will make up part of a series of federal deficits forecast over the next few years. The deficit is expected to balloon to close to $328 billion by the end of this year before shrinking to $13.1 billion in 2027. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. Police relations with Indigenous people in Alberta are on our watch list this week. We'll be talking to the Edmonton Police Chief and a new film looks at police brutality. Video journalist Chris Stewart is working on those stories. He joins us now from Edmonton. Chris. Thanks. This week I am interviewing Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee. I will be asking him what the relationship is like between the Edmonton Police and the Indigenous population here. He's Métis, so I'm interested in hearing the Chief's perspective. I will ask if he thinks a $2,000 fine is enough for an officer caught on tape in 2019 brutally kicking an Indigenous man in the head while on the ground. Will he still be working on the force? I will ask how the Committee to Improve Indigenous Relations is progressing and the police's policy on having officers wear body cams to help investigators when police go too far, such as in the case of Pacey Dumas. He says he was kicked in the head by an Edmonton police officer in 2020. He needed brain surgery and now lives with a hole in his head. I will also be talking to Métis filmmaker Daniel Foreman. He is releasing his first feature film called Abducted. The film is about a young man trying to find his lost sister. In the process, he runs into police brutality and racism. I found a stretch of highway called the Road of Tears. It's near where some of the other missing women were seen. I worry about you sometimes, Dakota. All these women disappearing and cops. I don't do nothing. You ain't gotta worry about me, Nietzsche. I got my girls looking out. No one cares about a bunch of Indian hookers and town drunks. I'll have those two stories this week on the APTN National News. Back to you. 
When it comes to business ventures in southern Quebec, the Cree Nation is reaching for the sky. In this case, literally. As our Lindsay Richardson reports, thanks to a new $100 million business partnership, the Cree will soon be leaving their mark on the downtown Montreal skyline. Take a peek around old Montreal, and you'll find only quick nods to the First Nations history of the area. But things are turning a corner, literally. Coming soon, the Cree Nation will have their own skyscraper right here on a main intersection in the city's most historic district. The first time we presented the project, you know, we had a different design and we, we submitted that to Mayor Plant of Montreal and uh, uh, right away she just pushed it away and said this is very generic, you know. I think that gave us more drive and motivation to say, okay, you know, we're going to build something unique and something iconic and, uh, and that's what we came up with. This is the concept design for Odea Montreal, a partnership between Creco and real estate titan Cogier. It's a $100 million, 25-story project with 435 planned residential units. The name Odea comes from the Cree word Ode, meaning canoe. Every space has an impact on the people inside it. A concept reflected in the design by renowned architect Douglas Cardinal. You can shape your environment but in turn, it shapes you. A longtime proponent for the indigenization of city spaces. From design to, to where we are today, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's already an accomplishment on its own, you know, just, uh, being, just having that creativity uh, as part of the project. You know. Mandy Galmasti, Grand Chief of the Cree Nation, called it an innovative and forward-thinking project showcasing Cree history, as well as an economic driving force for the Cree Nation. And there's additional irony. The street where Odea is going up is named for Robert Barassa, the Quebec politician who caused a major upset among the Cree in the early 1970s by greenlighting a major hydro project without prior consultation. The James Bay Cree and Inuit eventually won their case in court. And now, almost 50 years later, Derek Niposh says the construction of the Odea Montreal complex is yet another win for First Nations and Inuit in Quebec. The street is just a street for us, you know, but a building is more iconic, you know. And this building will, will display that, whatever the differences were, you know. Uh, we're, we're past that, you know, and we're, we're looking towards the future. and you know, setting up a landmark uh, building of this uh, uh, magnitude and, you know, and the display and design of it, you know, is uh, it's going to be amazing. Groundbreaking at the old Montreal site is underway and the finished complex is expected to open its doors to the public in spring 2024. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. All right, we have to take a short break, but still to come. For the first time in 150 years, Buffalo are back roaming on a First Nation in Saskatchewan. We'll have those details next. Welcome back. From Labrador to the Northwest Territories, woodland caribou are a species at risk. Meanwhile, stakeholders in Quebec are looking to find solutions to safeguard the species while also balancing the needs of the forestry industry. But some members of the Algonquin Nation doubt that's possible. Here's Shushan Bacon with that story, translated and read by Tom Fenario. Scenes like this have become increasingly rare. In the 1970s, the woodland caribous numbered in the thousands. Now, they have dropped to a few hundred. Le caribou, c'est une espèce comme les autres. Elle doit être sauvée. Benoit Croteau of Avitsby Winnie First Nation is part of a caribou committee that works for the safeguarding of woodland caribou. The committee also includes governmental, industry, and environmental groups. La seule raison pour laquelle Picagan participe, pour laquelle je siège sur ce comité-là, C'est que moi j'ai demandé qu'on travaille pour le caribou et non pas pour chacun de nos organismes. On n'est pas des spécialistes de la faune, mais dans nos activités, on intervient dans la forêt, dans l'écosystème, donc dans l'habitat du caribou forestier. Donc c'est à ce niveau-là qu'on qu tente d'avoir des, des, des pratiques qui puissent s'adapter à cette situation-là. Genevieve Labrec est le chef forester pour for Green First Forest Products. 
For her company, it is essential that she works on the committee not only to help the caribou, but also to keep their official status as an environmentally friendly forestry operation. For the dossier du caribou forestier, c'est entre autres pour euh, continuer à maintenir notre certification forestière FSC, d'où euh, certains critères dans la norme, dont euh, le respect euh, des habitats, des espèces. Euh, the Caribou Committee has been working at protecting woodland caribou in the region for nearly a decade. But a recent announcement by Pierre Dufault, Quebec's Minister of Forests and Fauna, to create an independent caribou commission was not well received by Croteau. Monsieur Dufault, ça ne me gêne pas de le dire, c'est un incompétent. C'est quelqu'un qui a aucune expérience dans le domaine de l'environnement. Il se fait dire euh, certaines affaires de la part de, de conseillers, puis il répète ça, puis finalement, ben, c'est à peu près n'importe quoi ce qu'il dit. Alors, c'est pas l'impression qu'on est écouté. J'ai comme l'impression qu'il y a un lobby euh, de l'industrie euh, qui refuse euh, de perdre des mètres cubes. Croteau says the Caribou Commission is a waste of time because there are already many studies done on the woodland caribou in Quebec. The Ministry of Forest website lists more than a dozen not including a 2010 Environment Canada study that also asked the Anishinaabe elders about caribou protection. Many continue to say the same thing. Greater habitat protection is needed. Bonjour à tous. Je prends... The Ministry of Forest declined to give APTN an interview for this story. But in an emailed statement defending the Caribou Commission, they said, the independent commission is intended to be a neutral and impartial way of hearing the voices of the people and of indigenous nations of better understanding local issues and of anticipating these repercussions in the strategy to come. As seen on this map in yellow, the Ministry of Forest and Fauna also recently announced the protection of a patchwork of 155,000 hectares of forest deemed unusable for forestry purposes. Croto says he would prefer a unified protected area managed by First Nations. As for the Caribou Commission, he's unsure if he'll testify. Can the government euh, propose des solutions qui euh, met en avant euh, d'autres piliers du développement durable comme l'économie, euh, ce n'est plus du développement durable. Hearings for the Independent Caribou Commission will commence early next year. A story by Shoshan Bacon, EPTN National News, Montreal. For the first time in 150 years, buffalo are back roaming on Cote First Nation in Saskatchewan. Hundreds of people were on hand to welcome the return of the sacred animal. APTN's Leanne Sanders has the story. is something Chief George Cody has been working toward for four years. 24 buffalo, including two bulls, quickly explored their new home, 900 acres of wooded pasture land on the First Nation near Camp Sac, Saskatchewan. Everyone from school kids to elders were on hand to celebrate alongside Chief Cody. We as First Nations people, you know, we, we fought to where we are today and, you know, and we're really grateful that uh, the buffalo is increasing in numbers as well as a result of what happened in history. So it's something that, you know, uh, Canada should know, non-First Nations people that, uh, you know, are, we're really proud of how First Nations are working together along with the non-First Nations to bring the buffalo home. The buffalo are part of an act of reconciliation. They were donated by an Alberta rancher and two Christian charities, Tear Fund Canada and Loco Coa a Samoan youth ministry. The animals were hauled over 900 kilometers to their new home. Cody is the third First Nation in Saskatchewan to welcome the buffalo back. Pipikasis and Zagame First Nations now have well-established herds. 
Cody says there have been many difficult years, but First Nations people are resilient, like the buffalo, which were hunted almost to extinction by settlers. You know, this just brings a sense of uh, calmness and peacefulness to our, to our spirit, you know, to know that uh, the buffalo have returned to our home. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Cody First Nation. And some more good news out of London, Ontario, where an Indigenous nonprofit has opened up a new winter shelter space for the city's homeless. This after a former site was destroyed in an act of arson. APTN's Elena McDougall has more. This teepee doesn't stand with just one pole. It relies on each pole to the left and to the right of it uh, so it can stand with support. And it's just like the people, we need support. Uh, everybody needs support. At Lotus of Family Healing Services is literally building up its vision for an Indigenous-led response to the need to shelter the homeless this winter in London, Ontario. Indigenous people represent 29% of the city's homeless. Albert Dockstader from Oneida Nation of the Thames said building the teepee is an honouring of the original instructions from Creator. By providing this teepee, you know, it just gives the opportunity for that healing, healing and connection. Um, a couple of things that are really needed for our people during these times and especially during the times of, that our relatives are in, uh, being homeless, being without, uh, especially in this uh, winter solstice time, you know, when people like to gather and, and have, uh, have that family around, you know. This program was threatened in November when an act of arson destroyed a previously announced shelter space at a shuttered city-owned golf course. An employee of the city has been charged in the incident, and the timing of the arson left at Losa and the city little time to secure an alternate site. With the creative thinking and the support of the City of London, we were still able to, to reach our target goal of December 1st to be able to have a secure space for community members to come to. And so um, we do now have community members on site uh, who are staying with us. And uh, the transition has been really, really good. Um, it's been a smooth process um, and they're just really grateful to, to be out of the cold. However, St. Joseph's Healthcare came through with a new space. An existing partnership between Atlosa Family Healing Services, the City of London, and St. Joseph's paid off. In a statement, Roy Butler, president of St. Joseph's, said the hospital is honored to work with Atlosa in the city. We need to work together to find meaningful solutions that address homelessness in our community, and we are thankful to be able to support this urgent need. The new site is an improvement because unlike the golf course, indoor space is available for programming and communal cooking. Within the kitchen, that, that seems to be the, the natural place, like any home, right, where everyone gravitates towards um, to uh, eat and talk and get to know each other and, you know, really build that relationship. We also have an activity room uh, where we plan on doing programming, so a lot of cultural-based programming is, is what we intend on doing over the next couple of months. Trailers that can accommodate up to 20 people are on site, and the building at St. Joseph's provides six rooms a family apartment, and space for indoor activity in addition to the teepee outdoors. King said it's the first time some of the site's residents have lived indoors since summer. I can tell you that there was some tears shed when uh, we introduced them to their new home for the winter. Programming will run at the St. Joseph site until March 2022. Elena McDougall, APTN National News, London, Ontario. All right, we need to take one more break, but stick around. A preview of tonight's Face to Face is next. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting over in the east, minus 3 in snow in Charlottetown and minus 1 in Fredericton. Minus 13 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 8 in Cartwright. Minus 2 and snow in Val d'Or and 0 in Montreal. Plus 1 in snow in North Bay and plus 7 in Sarnia. Minus 7 in a mix of sun and cloud in Big Trout Lake, and minus 5 in Sioux Lookout. Snow and minus 15 in Churchill, and minus 16 in Puckatawagan. Snow and minus 5 in Barron's River, and sun and minus 9 in Brandon. Minus 9 in North Battleford, and minus 5 in sun in Regina. Snow and minus 14 in Stony Rapids, and snow and minus 3 in Buffalo Narrows. Over in the west, snow and minus 14 in Fort Chippewan. Minus 2 in Calgary and minus 2 in Lethbridge. 
plus four in Campbell River and minus four in Quinnell. Minus 14 in Snow and Dees Lake and minus 18 in Fort Nelson. Minus 21 in Old Crow and minus 23 in Mayo. Minus 17 in Norman Wells and minus 17 in Fort Simpson. Minus 20 in Inuvik and minus 22 in Fort McPherson. Snow on minus 23 in Cambridge Bay and minus 14 in snow in Baker Lake. Minus 21 in Arctic Bay and a minus 23 in snow in Iqaluit. And now a remarkable story from our friends over at CTV News. An indigenous family in Saskatchewan has welcomed three sets of twins in just four years. Here's CTV Regina's Stephanie Davis. Katrina MacArthur and Trevor Lonechild are the proud parents of newborn twins. Look at that one. But Felix and Francine aren't their first set. They're not even their second. My first set is Halen and Hannah. They're four. Okay. And then my second set is Kitty and Kai. They're two and a half. And then my last set is Felix and Francine. That's three sets of twins conceived without medical intervention. We kind of thought it was a fluke, so I had to like look on at the Google it, see if it, <laughs> it was possible. The newest set were premature and are still in the neonatal intensive care unit. They're expected home next week, just in time for their first Christmas. They're eating so well and they're already over birth weight. MacArthur says each twin pregnancy became more shocking to her. It took me a long time to accept I was having a third set. And one fetal doctor says three consecutive twins is something he's never seen. If you do have a set of twins though, it does increase the probability of having twins again. But having um, three consecutive uh, sets of twins would be um, uncommon. Felix and Francine are child seven and eight for MacArthur. She already had a son and daughter before the first twins were born. Friends and family are all for seeing more. They were like, well, if you try again, <laughs> you'll have a whole hockey team. But she says eight is her magic number. This is the finish line. <laughs> Stephanie Davis, CTV News, Regina. That is just remarkable. All right, I will be the host of a new episode of Face to Face tonight as Dennis Ward is away with his newborn son. Our guest this week is former NHL head coach and player Ted Nolan. Now, Nolan coached the Buffalo Sabres and the New York Islanders, but he hasn't been in the NHL in nearly 10 years. Now, I asked why Ted why he believes that is. Here's a sneak peek of tonight's face-to-face -face with Ted Nolan. I was in it. I was coaching major junior hockey. I, I coached all-star games. I, uh, I won the Memorial Cup. Uh, coached in the NHL, but still I, I wasn't inside that, that group because uh, my, my group was back home. Uh, my group was back in Garden River First Nation. I, I couldn't wait to get home in the summertime and, and spend time with, with family and friends and, and, and go to powwows and, and what have you. And, but uh, uh, on the other side, they go to hockey clinics. They go to coaching seminars. They, they have golfing events. They have all these uh, situations that, uh, that they do. Um, and if you don't participate, uh, you're kind of like an outsider looking in. All right, that's all we have for you this evening. Stick around as a new episode of Face to Face starts right now. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.